Very much adding to what uh, Sophia already said, um, it's, it's not going to be like a, a history of archaeology seen from the angle of objectification. I, I, I skipped the, the history part, so to say, but I will add a lot of uh, terms and, and, and concepts uh, which, which you had very, on a very general level. I will now have in, in a more archaeological level, so to say. So I'm, I'm, I'll be talking about uh, process, about change, and about the social actors. So that's something that comes in new. You were looking very much at the material itself, and now I'm looking at the, the actors. Um, so which one is it? Yeah, OK. Um, so one, one of the interesting things about um, the concept of, of petrification, also it's not a, a clear-cut concept, um, is the way it connects um, the understanding of, of time and of materiality. And, and you already pointed to that. Petrification means both something reflected in material culture, if you've shown that, um, or happening in material culture or through material culture, um, that is hard objects, and at the same time it is something temporal, processual, liquid time. We always have to think of both things at the same time. The material that is expressing something and, and that the time is processing. Processes, transformations, change, this is our core business as archaeologists. But how do we describe processes? And very often, and you showed that already, we're thinking in opposites, in a Cartesian dualism, like egalitarian versus complex, or internal versus external, or fluid versus solids, to borrow terms from Tanya's presentation later. Um, and even where we develop a more fluid understanding of process and of culture, we may start with such a dualism, describing social change, for example, from disorder or appeal to stability or vice versa. So, petrification can be understood as one way towards such a more fluid understanding or more fluid conception of process, of change, um, and of culture as well. One pair of concepts that we might want to consider is conservatism versus progressiveness. In prehistoric archaeology, at least I know about the others, but we as prehistoric archaeologists, we tend to see pre-modern societies as more conservative than progressive. Although much of our research focuses on periods of technological change um, or social change, one reason, reason for this view of prehistoric societies may be that we are modeling them upon um, European societies, early medieval or even early modern peasant societies. And these farming societies were understood um, as having little potential for innovation, for uh, social change. Um, so therefore, in prehistoric archaeology, change was very often not understood as something inherent to all societies, but as an exception that needed an explanation. And thus we were um, looking for prime movers for external reasons um, to explain change. And these prime movers are, are causes located outside of the society under investigation, such as migration or diffusion um, or maybe climate. So this is at least true for the traditional cultural historical archaeology, but also for processual and evolutionist archaeologies, which approach society as a system analogous to organisms that are usually stable, while post-processualism, inspired by idealist and relativist thought, rather emphasizes the ability and necessity of societies to change from within. So grossly simplified um, for the former schools of thought, more solid houses could be the result of migrant groups or more rainy weather. <coughs> for the latter, more solid houses might mean the change in their symbolic value for the social actors. So rather an internal reason than an external one. As Christian uh, will point out later, we, not, we are now in a position to debate migration anew and to theorize and interpret processes of migration, integration and consolidation as both causes and outcomes 
of culture change. I have discussed elsewhere that um, on the one hand, societies are not necessarily stable and can change from within, from generation to generation. And on the other hand, <laughs> even where external factors such as migration or colonization can, can be made visible, these are in interdependency from structures and relations and developments within a society. Here, the concept of petrification, like the other one that we're not talking about today, the concept of hybridization, this concept may help to conceptualize both external and internal, practical and symbolical factors for change at the same time. So discussing petrification today, we might keep in mind the question whether this process re reflects a conservative society with little internal impetus for change or a progressive one, and if the tendency to petrify either artifacts or architecture or social relations wasn't used by internal or by external factors. So I'm still with the opposites here. Or we do follow a third path and perceive petrification as a kind of cultural evolution that is a more accidental process, something that's happening by slight changes over time from generation to generation. Maybe we even understand petrification as something teleological, something that necessarily happens in cultural evolution, leading to some preconceived end. So we, here we come back to Isaac Newton. It had a preconceived end why material was made that way. By this, however, we might neglect the deliberate decisions by social actors, understanding change simply as a result of demographic development and unintended shifts in, in practices from one generation to the next rather than as something that is intended. So I've been talking about um, reasons and mechanisms for change um, and uh, about process. And talking about process, I want to point out a, a paradox. We tend to, to cut continuous time, and, and Sophia already pointed to that, into discontinuous time slices. Even within a continuously occupied, multi-layered settlement tell, like the Neolithic tell at Vincha, Vincha Vela uh, we use the structural layers, burnt layers, Brandhobits on the German, as limits for time slices, and then start dating the occupation in between. So cutting time into slices. Where we do this dating by radiocarbon dating, we do date single discontinuous events. So event is not process. Because radiocarbon dates date the time when a, a piece of wood or a, or a human or an animal die. At the same time, we use a ceramic sequence that is not discontinuous because the single vessels were used and discarded but, um, and the vessel styles were changed continuously rather than as single events. But still, we use typology as time slices. So here we see a discrepancy between the continuous or liquid time of, of pottery sequences or of other kinds of material culture and the stepwise stage-to-stage -stage time of absolute dates that we use. And typology, as I've said, itself is a, a temporal concept where the objects are petrified while time is conceptualized liquid. So another aspect of process and change is innovation. Change in prehistoric periods is often understood as driven by technological innovation. The shift from the Neolithic to the Early Bronze Age in Central Europe, for example, was traditionally imagined as a diffusion, the gradual process of adopting a new technology and then learning to master it. However, new rate of carbon dating of graves of the Early Bronze Age in Southern Germany shows that the phases Bronze Age A1 and A2 that were perceived as sequent, uh, stages cannot be understood as a chronologic in a chronological sense, um, but rather reflect different abilities or willingness to adopt a new technology. Now introducing the concept of petrification, we now encounter another paradox. With petrification, we're looking at processes by which things, architecture or social structures, become more stable, more solid. Um, and I assume we tend to do so by taking an internal, by an aiming point of view, by looking at how things and structures become more solid within the society 
we study. Um, so in, in this sense, petrification may be opposed to innovation because with innovation, you rather look at the outside, at the external factors about technology being um, transferred and taken over and then mastered. So something happening between societies rather than within. Um, so the paradox is that petrification, in fact, may not have been opposed to, but indeed the result of innovation. Okay, I'll skip this part because I've already seen the, uh, the first sign here. Um, just one example of a, a petrification in, in architecture, um, an innovation in how people um, are dwelling and living together, building um, huge uh, walls around their urban places. So let's let's go on um, to to look at, at the objects, um, from social actors to the things themselves. While it may seem an essential trait of objects to be stable and solid, they are not. Their role and meaning depend on the context of use. Such a finely polished and, and very thin stone adds, as shown here, may refer rather to a symbolic context than to woodworking, and in fact, they have not been used for woodworking. Also, a sickle may be a harvesting tool in an economic context, but also a political tool in a political context. So it all depends on how things are used. So I'm back to the actors again. And we all know of examples of the reuse of, of objects like um, spoils, where the biography of the object gains a new chapter um, when put into a different context. But not only objects may shift in significance from one context to another. We usually think of LBK houses, and everybody go back to the houses, um, as the dwelling of an extended family, a practical architecture for working and sleeping. But the fact um, that these houses have a very petrified uh, layout that is not changing from generation to generation may show that it also has a symbolic value added to it. And even if um, the architecture itself is not changing, uses may be changing, like our the, uh, modern use of churches differs from the traditional use of churches. Just to, to, to show the example of a traditional use of a church, the architecture is still the same, but the way it is approached today, very often, is very different. Um, so I'll also skip knowledge transfer, you know, sort of already related to the way um, writing, communication. Um, we could talk about later about embodied knowledge that is rather um, in the way we handle things, um, and discursive knowledge that is rather about talking. Um, so here again, this relates to, to, to the objects and to the petrification, um, but I won't go into, into detail. Should I hurry up or should I finish here? Just to show the slides is similar to what, what uh, Sophia already presented, but using the um, actual material culture. Um, it's also a means, petrification also can be understood as a means of gaining control. We control the shape, we con control the layout, we control the pattern um, of material culture. Um, Roman pottery, of course, is a, is a very fine example of things being s the same, being identical um, all the time. Um, so we master technology and we master maybe society. We always want to relate petrification as a, as a concept referring to material culture. We always will want to relate that to social things, to the society and culture. So um, the petrification of patterns and of layouts may relate to the way also society is controlled. Um, the monumentality of architecture will be touched upon later, um, again, as a social issue of creating communities, um, something Jan Asman pointed out, uh, out um, monumentality as the creation of a collective, of a group, and of something beyond time, of eternity, that was his, his word. Um, on the other end of that spectrum, maybe what Francesco is going to present, um, houses which are not monumental in that sense, but still we can think about what this means for society if 
architecture becomes stone architecture rather than, than wooden architecture. And the same goes true uh, what we hear from Marina and Alessandro about um, images and, and Marta as well about the stele. Um, this all will not only relates to the material, stone or not, but also to the time. Is it changing over time, like this weather gargoyle, or is it stable? Is it, is it in fact solid or not? And it relates to society. What does it mean? Is society under control because it is using petrified objects or not? So, um, in the end, it is up to us if we consider these processes as something rather conservative or something rather progressive. Thank you. Oh, my God.